So, welcome to this presentation on how to detoxify the clinical reasoning process. What we're going to talk about today and the topic for today is basically trying to combat the failure to think clearly. So these errors we make in reasoning are quite predictable and they are, have a certain pattern like the pattern of dirt gathering in one corner all the time. So in my view, a good clinician does not spread or promote or base their reasoning process or their reasoning on unproven or false ideas. So one way we could view these clinical ideas is like they are a bit like viruses, meaning that an idea can be conceptualized as a virus that they spread from one uh, physiotherapist or therapist or clinician to another clinician. So the first thing we need to address is that actually being uh, skeptical and asking hard questions is actually a very positive act. So often it can be viewed as something negative, uh, asking hard questions and being critical, but really it is actually positive. The, it would be in fact be much, much more negative that we have certain clinical ideas that go unquestioned. Um, and one purpose of this uh, lecture is to one, help you choose the best ideas for the treatment uh, and care of uh, the, your patients but also to try to help you not make the same mistakes that the past generations has done. This is a statement made by Professor Patrick Hall Wall, uh, some 20 years ago. And he states that we should hopefully get away from this, uh, these uh, imaginary explanations or fantasyful explanations for real uh, phenomena. And sadly, even this was written some 20 years ago, there's still a lot of imaginary and very colorful uh, explanations for certain phenomena that we actually have not confirmed and some even we have disconfirmed. We now know that this does not actually happen in the in the body or the brain. Uh, but sadly, a lot of these um, colorful explanations are still present in the clinical landscape. So another uh, reason for this, or reason for this um, pandemic of pain or contributing factor, at least in my view, is that we are tied to historical ways of seeing the world meaning that the way we view physiotherapy, my profession, is passed on from the past generations to the new generations. So our worldview, how we deal with pain, how we treat pain, how we approach the painful patients are actually passed down from past generations to future generations. But this also means that that we basically have the same view as we had 30, 40 years ago, which n might not actually be the best way to approach pain and to the best way to approach the painful patient. A good saying by uh, a Swedish professor of technology is that you can't do much uh, carpentry with your bare hands and you can't do much good thinking with only a brain or a bare brain. So basically system run is intuitive, it's fast, it's highly automatic and it's quite undemanding of cognitive capacity. So it doesn't take a lot of skill and it doesn't take, um, it doesn't have a lot of cognitive load. So this is my own definition. So critical thinking is the systematic elevation of claims, beliefs using knowledge of science, argumentative theory, 
logical fallacies and cognitive biases. And critical thinking is a process where the purpose is to make better conclusions that are independent of one's own or other people's beliefs. When talking about critical thinking, we also need to divide it into internal and external critical thinking, meaning that internal critical thinking is the thinking we do towards our own inner dialogue, where external critical thinking is the critical thinking we do towards others. Another point that I hope that I had learned earlier in my um, reading of the critical uh, critical uh, thinking literature is when we should use critical thinking. So if I make the statement that the um, best dessert is a chocolate mousse, that's really not something that you need to be that critical about. If I, on the other hand, state that 30 bananas a day is the best way for any human to lose weight. There, that is another case. So we need to differentiate between subjective opinion claims and objective truth claims. So subjective opinion claims is basically something about I'm, I'm making a statement about taste. Often in debates on social media, or even in the academic papers, people will claim that other people are biased, which is kind of ironic because actually we are all biased. Then we have um, a bias called sudden slip. That's basically going for the obvious diagnosis. This comes from a bank robber. Uh, and he was caught robbing a bank and then he uh, was asked why do you rob banks and he basically said that because that's where the money is which is self-evident of course the money is at the bank but it's not only at the bank it also has to be transferred so sudden slip is going for the obvious diagnosis without thinking about other possibilities we are especially prone to cognitive errors when we deal with things we have an emotional attachment to one way or another. Meaning that if we have, if we have our teddy bear, if we have a firm belief in a modality, or if we have paid a lot of money for this uh, ultrasound or laser uh, machine, we will have a great problem in problem with being um, being objective. We have sort of put us in a tight spot. So we need to recognize that clinical outcomes are influenced by many other factors other than the intervention. That's one reason why we can't tell if a treatment works just from our observation and our experience, because there's a way to create a risk of something other than our treatment or intervention actually impacting the outcomes. So basically clinical outcomes are multifactorial. Then I have some recommendations for research that I would recommend that you follow up with. This was just a short um, introduction to uh, critical thinking and critical clinical reasoning. This is one quite uh, easily read paper that I would highly recommend. Thanks for being um, at this lecture. And I really hope that you've get, get gained a little bit of insight into uh, critical clinical reasoning.